Hey guys, so originally I had um, all of the freshwater ecosystems and all of the marine ecosystems together in one presentation, uh, which I was turning into one video, and I realized that it was getting way too long, um, almost an hour in length, all right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to chop this into two videos, so starting now, we're going to have part two of the aquatic ecosystems, and we're going to cover uh, marine ecosystems in this. Fair warning, this is my favorite stuff to study, so I get a little long-winded. All right, guys, I really want to show you some cool stuff, so follow along and take a look at some of these different uh, marine ecosystems. You might be familiar with some of them already from your uh, Biome Slides project, but uh, I'm going to cover some critical information here, and I'm definitely going to cover some of the ecosystem services from these different places. All right, guys, here we go. All right. Now we have marine ecosystems, and this is what I went to school for. This is my favorite stuff, okay? Uh, the marine ecosystems are our ocean ecosystems. And with 70% of our planet covered by the world ocean, you better believe that there's a wide variety of these ecosystems. But there are some general things that you can kind of apply throughout the world ocean. And a lot of it has to do with the availability of light. Now, in certain places where you have temperatures that are very warm or things like that, you might get some things that are a little bit different, like you've got the coral reefs on one side um, over, which way did I put those? Over there. Um, or you've got your kelp forest over there. All right. So looking at these, what you can see is that um, you have two different places here where you've got a lot of primary productivity, but one of them is extremely cold and one of them is nice and warm and toasty. Um, you have a huge amount of variation then in terms of nutrient availability and temperature. Um, and then all of this, you have uh, different currents as well. So you can have a surface current where you have a flow of water near the surface of the ocean that's largely driven by wind. But then you also have deep currents that travel along the bottom of the ocean and they can carry a huge amount of nutrients, but they're driven largely by cooling surface water or replacement of where you need to get water back to because the surface water is being pulled away by wind or wave action or cold water descending, any number of things. All right, so we're going to take a look at this and I'm going to show you how some of this works. All right, so to look at the marine ecosystems, what I want to do is I want to work from a perspective of going from the shoreline and working our way out. All right, so the first place we need to start are estuaries. So an estuary is where a river meets the ocean. All right, so what kind of water is in a river? That's fresh water. What kind of water is in the ocean? Salt water. So organisms that live in estuaries, what do they have to deal with? Both fresh water and salt water. All right. If you are a fish, you need to be able to deal with differing levels of salinity. In addition to that, another big challenge is fluctuating temperatures. River water might be colder than the ocean water or vice versa. The river water might be warm by comparison to the ocean water. You have tides. So in certain tidal situations, you have rivers that flow backwards where you have salt water flowing upstream a little ways and then back the other way. So you have reversing tides, um, high and low tides, um, changing temperatures, changing amounts of salinity, um, differing flow rates and nutrients and things like that throughout seasons. You might have a part of the year where you get a massive flood of cold, fresh water because of snow melt or something like that. So anything that lives in an estuary has to deal with a continually changing environment. And that's what you need to understand about the estuary as well. Take all the characteristics that you might have about a river and all the characteristics you have about um, the seaside and put them together and you've got a crazy recipe right there for what happens in estuaries. Okay, so one example that you have here is a saltwater swamp. And if you look at my pictures here, um, you can see that you've got this like kind of halfway across the waterline uh, picture of some kind of tree or something like that. Well, that's a mangrove, all right? Uh, mangroves are a pretty diverse group. You've got several, uh, you've got a couple different species of mangroves, uh, but what they have in common is they are able to live in a place where you've got 
changing salinity, changing soil quality, and sometimes very strong currents and waves. All right. Um, they get a constant influx of a lot of nutrients because you've got all the nutrients that are coming downstream with the river, but you've also got an exchange of water from the high and low tides. As a result, these mangrove swamps have gotten very good at stabilizing the soil around them, holding it in place, um, slowing down the flow of the river, um, absorbing those nutrients, and just being super, super productive. So mangrove swamps are actually places of incredibly high primary productivity. You've got a ton of carbon dioxide that's taken up. You've got a ton of uh, nutrients that are made um, and released into the environment, uh, as well as ones that are being absorbed by the environment. So you've got a lot of food basically available for plants, uh, from plants. You've got a huge amount of fish that will swim into these areas and use them as a nursery habitat, feed off of them. Um, it's just a very, very helpful, very productive environment. Now. Uh, you can see the overhead view that I have here as well, and you see those little channels. Well, those channels are fantastic at slowing down water flow, both coming from the river, but also coming in from the ocean. So if you have a huge storm, the storm surge and the big waves that you get get trapped and slowed down by these mangroves, and they can actually protect the shoreline uh, as well. So really important ecosystem services is one, regulating the flow of sediment and nutrients into the ocean to prevent damage to the ocean, and two, regulating the force of water flowing in from storm surge, which is a regulating thing that humans take advantage of. It reduces damage from stuff like hurricanes. So um, these pictures are from Florida. I've been to uh, mangrove swamps just like this, and they are incredibly uh, unique environments. You get um, everything from small crabs that literally can climb trees all the way down to giant manatees that swim in these channels. So these swamps are incredibly important to preserve and to protect our coastline. All right. Okay. Next one I want to talk about the intertidal zone. And this is a zone that stretches from the lowest low tide to the highest high tide. It is an area that will get covered by water and water will move away from it. Um, organisms here have to be able to survive waves, changing water levels, changing temperatures. Um, you have things like barnacles, starfish, snails, clams. This can be rocky or it can be sandy. And the picture that I've got there, you've got a uh, crown of thorns starfish right above me and that's a big scary starfish that can survive out of water for a period of time um, but then over to my side there you can see that you've got a rocky intertidal area and then you've got this like little area of um, a sandy beach that is also developed and water can get trapped in different places and organisms that get trapped in that water they have to be able to deal with the fact that that water temperature may go up when it's not being exposed to the ocean, you just got sun pounding down on it, that you might have evaporation, salt levels may rise. You may also have the problem of um, that water level going down and they don't have as much oxygen available as a result, all kinds of things, all right? So this is something else that the organisms that live here have to deal with. So let's take a look at the rocky intertidal uh, zone for uh, a quick comparison. In the rocky intertidal zone, you have several different areas that show up here. You have your area above the highest high tide that's up here, where it's pretty much out of the water all of the time. You may get water that splashes and sprays on there. So here you might have more terrestrial plants that are adapted to survive it, or you may have things like crabs that crawl up there and, and live there. Some oysters might be able to live up there as well, but generally up here in that highest level, you're not gonna get as much aquatic life being able to survive there. Because remember, this is never underwater. Then at your next level, you have the upper intertidal zone. That's this blue area right here. And there, what you'll have are organisms that um, they're okay with being submerged for a short period of time and then out of the water for a longer period of time. Then below there, you get the 
middle zone where you get barnacles and organisms like that. Barnacles are filter feeders and they're actually crustaceans, so they're related to crabs. Um, barnacles are um, kind of interesting little organisms. Um, they attach themselves to rocks. They have a small area that they can open up and they stick their little filtery arms out and they suck in all of the suspended stuff in the water column. Then, when the water level goes down due to low tide, they close up their shell and they hide until the water returns. Um, and then below there, you get a kind of middle intertidal zone where you'll get larger and different species of barnacles. But here, you're also going to start getting um, larger invertebrates like limpets. And limpets are, uh, if you can imagine a clam, but with only one shell on top of it that crawls along, uh, kind of like a flat snail instead of a spiral shell um you get hermit crabs you get organisms that can live longer underwater um and then as you go down you get the lowest of the intertidal zones that is only exposed to air for a short period of time um and down there you're going to get organisms that need a lot of water all right um, and even in here, what you might get is you may get areas where the water will collect and stay there even during low tide. So you get organisms here that can even be small fish sometimes. All right. And then lastly, down at the lowest level, this is the uh, subtidal zone. So basically, the water doesn't ever really go away from here. It kind of it may get thin. It may get very shallow. But generally speaking, these are underwater almost all of the time. There's a very, very short period of time where they're underwater. And down here, you're going to get your uh, soft-bodied organisms like anemones and um, uh, some of the seagrasses, some fish, uh, lobsters, stuff like that. Organisms that need to stay underwater all the time are going to be down here in this lowest area. So that's just a couple of the things that you will get um, in this rocky intertidal. And this can vary greatly. Um, some intertidal zones are going to be more productive than others. Some are going to be warmer. Some are going to be colder. So then you have that challenge as well. In colder areas, you may have organisms that have to be able to deal with near freezing temperatures during part of the year. Or in warmer areas, you may have organisms that are submerged under water that's in the 50s and 60s, the water is. But then they're out in the air and it's over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And so the organisms have to be able to survive these rapidly changing conditions that keep in mind, they change every day, all right? It's not like, oh, okay, so uh, I've got a you know couple months where I have to do this. No, no, it's every day you go from 50 to 60, uh, 50, 60 degrees to 100 degrees, back again, back and forth and back and forth. And so they have to be able to survive in these rapidly fluctuating conditions. And that's hard for almost any animal. All right. So then you move out from the intertidal zone and you get to this area called the neuritic zone. And this is where the water is shallow enough to allow photosynthesis almost all the way to the bottom. All right. Sunlight passes through this zone, so photosynthesis can occur. Um, you can get large um, sea plants, only they're not plants, they're algae, so they're technically in the kingdom Protista. Um, you can get large amounts of photosynthesis happening here, so you've got very, very productive waters. You've got a lot of fish in this area. You've got a lot of economic benefit to this area, where people go fishing a lot. Um, and there's many, many living things here. Now, in cold areas, you can get large kelp forests. In warm areas, you can get coral reefs. So let's take a look at some of these different things you can get in this neuritic zone. Remember, you're close to shore, but you're still shallow enough that you're, you're underwater all the time, but you can get sunlight almost to the bottom. Um, so in some areas, you can get what's called coastal upwelling. This is where you're going to have cold water. And what happens is surface winds push warm water away from an area and cold water rises up to replace it. Um, you have a convection uh, system that goes here. As a result, it cycles like this. Um, so cold, nutrient-rich water rises up and it feeds near shore communities. And one of the best examples of this are the kelp forests. Now, the kelp forests, you find these generally um, in colder water environments with a lot of coastal upwelling. This kelp needs a lot of nutrients, and that's provided, and this is an excellent nursery habitat. Not only that, kelp is used in a lot of different uh, things that we consume. 
Um, anything that has agar or alginate in it, so like boba tea, those little popping boba, those are made from sodium alginate. Um, and that is that skin is actually made from the proteins that are refined from kelp. Yeah, it's a really, really cool plant um, that's also found in cosmetics. It's used in ice cream to keep the ice cream from forming crystals and getting all gross and freezer burned. Um, it's used in culturing bacteria to uh, study bacteria or produce things like antibiotics. Um, it's used in cell and tissue culturing to create skin grafts to help burn patients. These kelp forests are extremely valuable to modern medicine, to modern technology, to our foodstuffs, and we don't even realize how important they are until we almost lose them, which we did. And uh, I will talk about that in the next unit. All right, so let's talk about one of the most charismatic of the marine biomes, and that's the coral reef, okay? So these two pictures here are both from Hawaii, all right? And there is a difference between them. The one above me, um, that's from a company called Fairwinds uh, Snorkeling. What they do is they take people to um, unique snorkeling and dive sites in uh, Hawaii. They tell people about the ecology of the area. Um, they do scuba diving and snorkeling trips um, that are daytime trips. They literally just go up the coastline and um, it's actually on a sailboat. So they use very, very little gas uh, to get there. Usually they will sail up there actually to uh, reduce their environmental impact. Uh, it's a company that I've worked with before and they do a pretty good job of um, trying really, really hard to get people invested in protecting um, the coastline, specifically of the state of Hawaii. And they talk about, you know, why this is so important for Hawaii. So let's talk a little bit about what coral reefs do. So first off, you're going to find coral reefs in warm waters in the shallows. All right. So you usually find them in tropical waters, um, only found in warm waters, um, 18 to 30 degrees uh, Celsius. So that's um, about high 60s to low 90s in the water temperature. All right. So they like warm water. But here's the thing. Any one species of coral does not like the water when it shifts more than about uh, five or so degrees Celsius. All right. Um, here, biodiversity is extremely high and the coral is actually an invertebrate animal that lives and produces a shell around itself. And that's what forms these coral heads that you can see here. All right. So these outcroppings like this right here. That is all coral that's been built up over thousands of years sometimes, just skeleton of single-celled organisms, one on top of another, again and again and again, building up these big coral heads. Those coral heads provide a nursery habitat for a lot of uh, fish, a lot of tropical reef fish. Um, they provide a very real benefit in protecting shorelines from heavy storms and surf. They literally will build up to a point where they're just under the high tide line and the water just suddenly gets shallow and it will stop incoming waves. In fact, there have been numerous times where Hawaii's coastlines have been saved from storm surge, from big waves and things like that, from heavy storms, um, hurricanes, uh, those kind of things because of healthy coral reefs around them. Um, they are a major repository of minerals and nutrients. They photosynthesize extremely quickly and they are extremely uh, productive in terms of primary productivity. Not only that, they are also places where you have unique organisms that don't live anywhere else and they have become a place of new drug discovery as well. Um, there are species of animals there that produce bizarre and interesting toxins that are being investigated for everything from uh, antibiotics to non-addictive pain relief. Um, one that um, my mom was actually able to work on part of the clinical trial for was for cancer patients suffering from chronic deep muscle pain as a result of chemotherapy. Um, traditionally, what people have been given for things like that is um, high power narcotics that basically make it so these folks they can't function, all right? They are literally just, you know, impaired by these powerful narcotics. 
Well, there was a study that was done using the venom of one of the most poisonous animals on Earth called the cone snail. And there is a medication that was developed that is good for a specific type of pain that is a localized thing. Um, and it does a great job of treating pain without causing any other broad side effects. It literally just paralyzes nerves in an area so that it can reduce the amount of pain from there. Usually it's used in conjunction with chemotherapy to stop pain at injection sites. All right, uh, coral reefs though are facing some major issues. So I want you to take a look over here. You see this one coral head. You see how it's this weird pale white color? Well, that's something called coral bleaching. See, coral actually gets its color from not the little plant, little organism that lives there, but the little plant cells that live inside that organism. Yeah, it's actually a commensalistic relationship between zooxanthellae, which are a type of single-celled plant, and the coral polyp, which are actually cnidarians, closely related to jellyfish. I know, coral's super weird. All right, the problem is, though, when the ocean temperatures get too high, or the pH gets too low, meaning the water gets more acidic, or there's uh, chemicals that are introduced in the water, especially copper-based chemicals. Copper sulfates are really, really bad for coral. The coral gets stressed out, and its immune system goes nuts, and the zooxanthellae, the photosynthetic organisms that live inside of it, die off. And then the coral can't feed itself because they get energy from the photosynthesis that occurs inside them from those zooxanthellae, from those uh, commensalistic organisms living inside them, all right? So what happens here is the coral dies and it leaves just a shell. Now that can support life for a while, but eventually that will get ground down by ocean and you'll end up with a sandy bottom and then you get much worse storms. Now this is happening around the world and there's a worry that within the next 20 to 50 years, we could have no more coral reefs. And I can tell you within my own life, working with places like Fairwinds, going scuba diving in places like the Florida Keys and Hawaii, I can tell you that the coral has decayed. It has degraded. The color is being lost. The total fish population is going down. The invertebrate species are disappearing. And it is, it is heartbreaking and terrifying. It's part of the reason why I got into marine biology in the first place. The thing is though, what has been shown is if these areas are protected, if we manage runoff from storm water and things like that and prevent pollution from washing into the ocean, these coral reefs can bounce back, but it takes a concerted and powerful effort to do so. So if we wanna keep these amazing repositories of biodiversity and just amazing ecosystem services that we get from them, we have to put the work in to protect them. Okay, now we're gonna move away from the shoreline out into deeper water. What we're gonna have here are the open ocean areas. And some key things to know about this place is that um, at the very top, you have uh, plankton and stuff like that that floats around in the water column. Um, that plankton is a single-celled organism. Again, remember that usually. Or it's technically anything that is too small to be able to swim faster than the current, like against it or even with it. Um, necton then are anything that can swim against the current. Um, the plankton, a huge portion of it's going to be tiny single-celled photosynthetic organisms that provide the basis for the food chain out in the open ocean. But you are going to also have um, tiny single or just a few celled organisms that swim around and eat that, um, that photoplankton. And then they are eaten by larger animals in return. This is an area where you get a lot of really big fish that go out and develop by eating small fish that eat that plankton. Um, it's divided up into three zones based on the light availability. You have your surface or photic zone. That's the first few hundred meters where light can penetrate to and you get photosynthesis occurring, high oxygen content, and you get um, a lot of the kind of bigger, more charismatic fish. Um, and this is also where you're gonna get a number of marine mammals and all sorts of cool stuff like that. Then you have the twilight zone and that's deep and there the light is at like kind of a dark twilight level all the time like after the sun is set that kind of light level um, here 
there's very little photosynthesis, but a lot of organisms pass through this zone. There are a number of fish and squid species that hang out in here and wait for the sun to go down, and then they travel up to feed on various organisms, um, anything from plankton to organisms eating that plankton. And then lastly, you have the deep zone, down, 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 below where light can penetrate to. The light doesn't reach here. And a lot of times you get bizarre organisms that have all kinds of strange adaptations. And here, they will rely more heavily on things sinking down from the surface, either plankton that's died, decaying bodies of different organisms, um, stuff that's been washed out to sea. And this can go pretty much all the way down to the bottom of the ocean. And sometimes you get really, really strange organisms. Um, and they're feeding on whatever drifts down as well as on each other. Um, so this is kind of a unique area as well. And you get a lot of life down there that you don't see anywhere else. Overall, though, the open ocean has a much lower level of primary productivity than the neuritic zone near the shore. So keep that in mind. In the open ocean, the total primary productivity is actually lower. Okay? All right. So the open ocean is incredibly important because this upper sunlit zone is where a lot of plankton is, and this is where large fish a lot of times travel. Um, humans have caused a huge impact here by overfishing or overconsuming things from this region. Um, in here, you have that eutrophic zone where you have the bright upper lit levels, and this is where a lot of our really important, commercially important fish, like tuna or, hey, swordfish, this guy. Well, this right here, this teeny tiny little thing, that's a baby swordfish. Yeah, notice how it's a little sword grows first. This is what they look like when they're fully grown, and that sword is still present. These guys are huge and can weigh hundreds of pounds. Commercially important, um, tiny little thing that is easily killed. So we have to protect this, even if it seems like an open, useless area. And so one of the big challenges here is stuff like uh, plastic and floating debris and garbage and stuff. Something that worries me is there's a lot of groups out there that are saying, oh, well, why don't we get big nets and just go out and scoop up all the plastic? Well, look how tiny this little guy is. How are you going to scoop up all that plastic if you've got these little guys there as well? So that's a big challenge to cleaning up that plastic and waste in the ocean is any action you take might be damaging to the base of this food chain out there or these juvenile organisms that are developing. And then they eventually will get big. So this guy right here, this is called a mola mola. This is an ocean sunfish and this guy eats nothing but jellyfish. Yep, uh, big open ocean fish cruises along nice and slow and uh, it's been tagged here with a radio tag so you can track uh, how far it swims. They swim for thousands and thousands of miles. And again, they eat plastic sometimes too, and that can kill them because it looks like the jellyfish that they're supposed to eat. So these are challenges that they have. And yeah, it makes me sad every time I think about it. All right, guys. So this is the last part that I'm going to try and cover for you quickly. So I've gone through the different biomes. I've talked about ecosystem services from all of them. I've talked about, you know, the different characteristics of them. But this is the last thing that I want to cover here for the open ocean. And I'm going to go through just a couple of slides really fast. And honestly, I really wish I could spend more time talking about this. But I think I should probably wrap this video up because I'm now coming up on 45 minutes. So, hey. The open ocean provides thousands um, and thousands of jobs, hundreds of thousands of jobs every year globally, all right? Um, this is an impact right here that is beyond provisioning, beyond all that stuff. This is a cultural ecosystem service. So you have transportation. We ship a bunch of goods across the ocean constantly. Uh, fishing, um, both sport and commercial. Um, energy, yeah, we have deep ocean uh, oil rigs that gather energy for uh, the use on land. Defense, the U.S. Navy is the largest Navy in the world, and it is the largest branch of the U.S. Armed Forces. And literally, it is able to project power anywhere in the world for anything from defense, securing safe passage for ships, things like that, all the way up through humanitarian aid, because a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier can refine something like 30,000 gallons of fresh water a day, which could supply a uh, seaside community with water if they've been hit with a hurricane. 
which is something that we do actually pretty regularly. And then tourism. Um, you've got these guys here going out, going sport fishing. That's hundreds of dollars to go on one of those trips per person. That makes somebody's job. Um, a lot of times they're now also catch and release in addition to doing that. So they put this fish back in because that fish is going to make more fishies. All right. You have other fish like this guy right here. This is the Maki Maki or dolphin fish. It's not a dolphin at all. It's just a fish. Um, these guys are an important commercial crop as well as a sport fish that people pay big money to go out and catch. And then you've got this guy right here. This is a bluefin tuna. Uh, sorry, no, this is a yellowfin tuna, not even a bluefin, a yellowfin. Bluefin tuna can actually get bigger than that. And there was a bluefin tuna that sold at auction for $2.3 million just a month or two ago. So, yeah, ton of money comes from the ocean, from the services that the ocean provides. And that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about here. But at the same time, even though we get all this stuff, we know so little about the ocean. There's a bunch of stuff that we're just not familiar with. Like this weird stuff. Yeah, I talked about these in class a little bit. You've got your uh, barrel eye fish. This is the top of his head. His eyes are right here. They've located inside his head and they stare through a clear skull. Why? That's super strange. Okay, how about this? This is a viper fish. It can disarticulate its jaw and swallow something bigger than itself. Lantern eye fish. They've got a little searchlight that shines out from underneath their eye that lets them see in the dark. This is weird stuff that lives in a zone where there's no photosynthesis. So for hundreds of years, people thought that nothing lived down there because there was no light down there. So they just trashed it. This right here is a deep sea anglerfish. Um, these guys can swallow massive things all at once. And they're actually related to shallow water fish, which are pretty well known called frogfish. Uh, this right here is the male. They form a type of parasitic bond between the female and the male, where eventually the male will be absorbed into her body. It's called parasitic hermaphrodism. It's so strange, and we are just discovering how this stuff works. How about some scary, terrifying stuff? This is a Humboldt squid. Yeah, this is how big they get. They hunt in packs like wolves. They light up and shine different colors. They attack tuna. Remember that tuna on the other slide? Yeah, that's one getting attacked there. They hunt sharks, and inside their suckers are these serrated little mouth parts. But guess what, guys? These are used and processed into a ton of food worldwide. Um, anything that has, like, fish flavor to it, um, like the seafood flavor of ramen stuff like that a lot of times it's made with the, these guys these are also processed into uh fish food to feed fish for fish farming um and this is the beak that they have this massive predatory beak these are crazy animals and they live down in the sea of cortez you know that area between mexico and baja california yeah humboldt squid and then you've got this deepest, darkest zone where you've got organisms that break the rules for what we thought life had to have. This is a chimera. Um, it's actually a species of shark. Well, distantly related to sharks. They split off about 300 million years ago, but they're cartilaginous and they're in the chondrichthys group. This is the blobfish. People think it's the ugliest fish that ever created. It's 95% water. It's mostly this weird fat, and they just kind of float above the surface and suck up anything that sticks out of the mud. This is a Yeti crab. They live around hydrothermal vent communities, and they grow algae in this fur on their arms. That's why they're called the Yeti crab. These are tube worms, these red things. Those are the gills of the tube worm. That worm can be six feet long, and it harbors chemosynthetic bacteria inside of it that doesn't need sunlight to produce food. It uses hydrogen sulfide to do it. And then these uh, kidney clams here, they're literally this big, bigger than my head, and inside them they harbor a different species of chemosynthetic bacteria. But you know what, guys? For a long time, we thought the bottom of the ocean was empty. So we just dumped our trash there over and over and over again. This right here is called Project Chase. It's one of the more ecologically damaging product projects that the U.S. government has ever done. And they did it in the name of peace. So at the end of World War I, they had all these stockpiles of gas, nitrogen gas, sulfur gas, mustard gases. All right. These gases were used to injure and kill soldiers. And we thought that maybe we would never need them again. We'd never have another war. 
So tons of bombs, munitions, ships, whole ships were chopped up and sunk in the ocean, in the North Atlantic, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, in the Pacific, all over. The U.S. government just dumped this stuff in there. And these barrels are still down at the bottom of the ocean. You can see one right here. Hey, it's conveniently circled. This is full of chemical waste, essentially. This has nitrogenous or sulfur mustard gas in it. Those are blister agents. They will burn you if you get them on them. So a little warning here. This next picture is going to be a little graphic. But this is what uh, mustard gases do to the human body. These barrels are decaying. They're releasing their stuff into the ocean. They're killing fish. And fishermen who are just trying to make a living are getting their nets tangled in them. And when they handle the nets, this is what happens to them. Guys, we live in Arizona, so I know the oceans seem a world away, especially with everything that's gone on this year. But if we don't protect our oceans, we're doomed. Because the oceans are the life of our planet. And this is the stuff that I studied, and it's incredibly important to me. So this is a review video. We're going to cover the same stuff in class. You'll have the slides that we produce in class. But I wanted to make this as well, because to me, this is critically important. This is what's going to be what makes or breaks our environment in the future. All right, guys. Well, thank you for sticking with me. That's been a long video. I know. I should probably cut this thing up into some pieces. In fact, I think I'm going to do that. I'm going to chop this into two sections. All right, guys. You take care. You have a great day. I'll see you soon. Bye, guys.